Perhaps, looking back on it, we were doomed from the start. I guess it should have been obvious what would happen. But in the rush to war, no one thought past the invasion and the transfer of power. Once we'd affected the regime change, there was no sense that we might have to stick around. We rushed into the business with our usual disregard for a comprehensive political <clears throat> scheme. No one had thought through what it might take to help the Iraq people make the transition to a workable democracy. Help. A stable functioning government of any kind. I believe I was the one who first articulated the plan. It went something like this. Something they still don't have, by the way. Mesopotamia would have a good British father and the High Commissioner. She would be nannied by British advisors and be mothered by me. Like any tractable, well-reared child, she would return the favor in kind. Her general sentiments would be ones of gratitude and loyalty, as well as a natural obligation to protect the parental route to India, giving us the wealth of her agriculture, archaeology, and oil. The only project anyone was ever interested in was taking out Saddam. We would protect the oil, but that was the only thing the American military was committed to protecting. The looting, the destruction of the culture, the squaring off of rival ethnic and religious factions, the whole, well, the whole mess that followed the invasion. If anyone had cared, it all could have been anticipated. It wasn't. We were supposed to just take the country from Saddam and turn it over to a bunch of Iraqis who picked to run it? As if everybody would have just been fine with that? It's like no one had ever read a book about the place, or even just rented Lawrence of Arabia. We sat in our ornate room day after day, a mass of men and me, alone of all my sex, as it were, carving up the Eastern world the vast holdings of these former empires, the Austro-Hungarians, the Russians, and of course, the Turks. Countless of miles. Well, I suppose they can't be counted, can't they? The seed of civilization has been figured out by the Hebrews. It is the Garden of Eden, after all, the green cradle between the Tigris and Euphrates. It is where it all began. But then the whole thing unravels. We're standing in rubble. The country is in chaos. I shuddered to hear the way these men spoke. Some of them, <coughs> my countrymen, pale denizens of government buildings who have spent their lives scuttling down marble halls. Men who never look up. Men who have never seen the light of day, much less the desert sun. We start trying to make sense of what we've done. When these men spoke of the people of the country we were cutting into bits, they spoke of monkeys and barbarians and worse. They said this about a great people who were writing great poetry and making great art while their ancestors were still sitting in the mud. Turns out we're supposed to build a new country from the ground up. Someone else's country. That's when it just becomes this ludicrous improvisation. The Sunni nationalists want an Arab kingdom. The Shiites want an Islamic religious state, and of course, the Kurds in the north want an independent Kurdish entity. Basically, it's up to us to justify doing the thing after we've done it. No one can agree on what they all want, except that they don't want us. So yeah, we create habit, and then we want to be thanked for it. We promised them an independent <laughs> Arab government with British advisors, and we gave them a British government with Arab advisors. It's the American delusion. We always come into these things with a toxic combination of confidence, naivete, and a will to power. We would allow them to advise us on how to run their country. Military occupations go wrong. They just do. Even when they begin with the best of intentions. The reason for this is because you always have to do the same things to occupy a country. You have to come in with force, which is always going to hurt some of the people you don't intend to hurt. 
And then because you don't know the territory, the language, or the people, you have to set up your network of local informers. You become completely, cripplingly dependent on these locals. And these locals will do the wrong thing sometimes for any number of reasons. Maybe they're using the opportunity to settle scores. Maybe they just make mistakes. People make mistakes. But when you're kicking down the wrong doors, when you're arresting the wrong people, and you really can't avoid doing this, harming the innocent, doing damage however limited, local resentments are inevitable. Local resistance grows, and then, well, what happened before will happen again. The country will shake the occupiers off. And it doesn't matter what kind of benefits the occupiers brought in along the way. What matters in the end is the mistakes they made, the damage they did, because that's what will be remembered. Ibn Saud once challenged even the notion of national borders. <clears throat> Iraq, he said, was a fiction in which his people would never believe in. He called it a made-up place, and indeed it is. He said, my people do not think as you do. You draw marks on a piece of paper and call it a desert. My people do not see marks. We only see the horizon. It shifts as we journey toward it. We are memories. You are map makers. And the country will return, for better or for worse, to the state it was in before all of this happened. Everybody knows this, but no one knows it better than the Iraqis. They've been doing it for centuries. They know it's just a matter of waiting it out. I told Jafar Pasha complete independence was what we ultimately wished to give. My lady, he said, they were speaking in Arabic, complete independence is never given. It is always taken. We are the ones who lead. That's what they know. Lifestyle.